Uh, first off, a, a couple of announcements as, as people continue to come in. Um, uh, first, a uh, major celebration and a joy to announce uh, I, that I got a text uh, not too long ago that Katie and Steve had their baby yesterday. You know, everyone is really uh, anticipating that. It's, it's a little boy, everyone's healthy. They don't have a name yet, but we rejoice for them uh, after their long wait. So um, and look forward to uh, uh, more pictures and info and a name soon. Uh, on Friday, we sent out a meal uh, train for them. If you're interested in that, you can check the email. Um, coming up, um, well, today we celebrate a, a pretty special day that's kind of an underrated day in the church calendar. It's called uh, the, the Ascension uh, Sunday. The Feast of the Ascension was on Thursday. And what I love about this, and we'll get the reading from Betty Jean uh, later, what I love about this holiday is that it's really a holiday that uh, is for those of us who um, it's much easier to feel and understand Jesus's absence from us than Jesus's presence among us sometimes. Um, uh, sometimes it's hard to under, understand how, just how God is with us. And so we join with those disciples who saw Jesus um, pledge to be with them, give them the gift of the spirit, and then uh, leave them uh, in, in a really stark and mysterious way. Um, and so we celebrate that uh, today um, because it, it is also a sign and a remembrance that Jesus sits with the, the Father at God's right hand and rules over everything, even in, in ways that are often mysterious and invisible to us. Um, so I, as we continue in the season, I talk about uh, we believe we are believing into this uh, mysterious uh, lordship of Jesus, and today is one of those days. Next week uh, is the Feast of Pentecost, and our liturgy planning team was trying to talk about some ways to make Pentecost special uh, for us as we worship from afar. And a couple of the things we came up with uh, um, were that we would all wear red next week. Um, red is the color of Pentecost. So how cool would it be to see in your grids that we will wear red? Uh, also, Pentecost is the moment where we, where, uh, we celebrate the church's birthday. It is the birth of this Jesus movement um, all around the world, Jews and Gentiles alike. Um, and we are joined into that movement. And so um, you're invited to make a cake or cupcakes uh, so you, uh, to celebrate that. And you can share that on social media. You could make an extra cake or cupcakes and share them with a neighbor. Um, and bonus points, if you, may, if you wear red, make cake and that it's a red velvet cake. That would be even awesomer. Um, so you're, you're invited into that, a way that we can share uh, with each other uh, in this time. Uh, also, uh, for our Pentecost celebration, we'll have a, a special guest um, next week, uh, Chris Green, who um, is a friend and uh, former professor of uh, Justin Farmer and Jessica, um, and uh, a, a real joy to invite a, a brilliant uh, theological mind uh, to be among us. We get to do, uh, for all the things that Zoom Church doesn't enable us to do, it enables us to do some really cool things like host um, some far-flung guests, one of whom is with us today, all the way from Heidelberg, Germany, Joe Longarino, uh, the famous Joe Longarino. Um, uh, and, and we're so glad uh, to have our friend back with us today. Um, so, uh, without further ado, we'll um, uh, have our call to worship in which you can join me together. Oh, actually, before that, I, I, told, I told Meg and Christian that I would give them a moment, and I stepped on it. Um, so uh, first off, um, for the respective kids and music ministries of Oak Church, I, I wanted to give each of them a, a moment to, to uh, say what's going on and, and how you can get involved. Go, go for it, Meg. So today, since it is uh, the Sunday that we remember the Ascension, um, the Godly Play lesson 
you know, we, we're doing Knowing Jesus in a New Way, which starts at Easter Sunday and goes all the way through all the um, appearances of Jesus to his followers um, after he uh, resurrected. And this week is the Ascension. And you can see the picture for today on your screen. It's, it's just the disciples looking up after he's gone, um, wondering what in the world to do next. Um, the, if you want to go on the website and click on the Godly Play lesson for today, it's a, it's a long one, but it's a good one. I also include several different famous artist renderings of the Ascension and invite children to um, create their own piece of art uh, uh, of what they imagine it might have looked like. Um, and of course, grown-ups might enjoy watching it too. Um, it's a lot of fun. That's great. Thanks, Meg. Christian, do you have anything going on with music ministry that you'd like to share? Uh, music, as you have all seen, we're doing music on Zoom calls each Sunday. So like, if you play or sing, be involved in that. That's one option. We have a mustard seed group that meets on Thursday nights where we're talking. Most of the time we just catch up, but we're kind of going in a new direction to start talking about music and arts and its role in the church and faith. And lastly, we have some recording projects, very similar to what we did for the Good Friday service that you can be a part of. And that's just getting started back up. So if you're interested in any of those opportunities, you can just shoot me an email or a DM on any social media. Awesome. So if, if y'all will join me in our call to worship, this comes from Matthew 18. Joyful is the sound we make this morning, for Christ being raised liberates us from doubt and fear. Thankful is the song we sing, for Christ being raised moves us past darkness and despair. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Christ lives here and now. He is among us at this and every moment. May his peace and presence be known to you and also with you. Let us greet one another with expressions of Christian love. And to do this, as we have in previous weeks, uh, Rachel is going to introduce a uh, uh, icebreaker for our breakout rooms. All right, so in a minute, we're going to send y'all into smaller rooms with groups of four or five households, our homes, and um, you can uh, share a sign of Christ's peace, and also we'll reuse the discussion prompt from last week since only half of people could hear. Um, so share if you could have dinner with any living person who you would choose to have over, and coronavirus is not a thing, so they can come to your home, eat at your table, share your food, who would you choose? So we'll give you about four minutes, make sure everyone gets a chance to share, and then we'll bring you back together in the big room.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, Christian's going to lead us in our first song this morning. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in his time appointed, his reign on earth begun. His reign on earth begun. He comes to break oppression, to set the captive free, to take away transgression and rule in equity. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in this time appointed, his reign on earth begun, his reign on earth begun. He comes with comfort's beat to those who suffer wrong, to help the poor and need, and bid the weak be strong, to give them songs for sighing, their darkness turned to light. Who souls condemned and dying are precious in his sight. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in his time appointed, his reign on earth begun. His reign on earth begun. He shall come down like showers upon the fruitful earth. Love, joy, and hope like flowers bring in his path to birth. The tide of time shall never his covenant renew. His name shall stand forever, that name to us is love. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in his time appointed, his reign on earth begun. His reign on earth begun. Y'all pray with me. Uh, Lord Jesus, we um, give you thanks and we hail you as um, the Savior, as the Messiah, as the Christ, the, the one who um, is and was and is to come, and the one who is with us even in your absence. Um, thanks for all the gifts that you give us on this day, um, for this beautiful day that you made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, for showing up to us um, in our homes and um, in uh, these spaces that um, can sometimes feel uh, isolated or lonely. Uh, thanks uh, for um, your uh, power and your mercy and your care and your concern for this creation that you so love. Uh, we pray all this in the name of the Ascended Jesus. Amen. I invite Betty Jean to read for us from Acts. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the names or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, 
as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, Alphaeus' son, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, James' son, all were united in their devotion to prayer, along with some women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though I may wander, I still will follow. Though I may wander, still I will follow. Though I may wander, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. stars will lead us in our responsive psalm. All righty, so I will read the regular font, and Jana, which represents the internet congregation, will read the bold font. Uh, so this is from Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, in the land they, they are the are in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. 
in the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Hast thou seen him burn Is not thine a captured one? Chieftain bone ten thousand Joyful choose the better boy. Captivated by his beauty, worthy tribulates to bring. That is fearless worth the tree. What can strip the scene of beauty from the idols of the earth? Not a sense of right or duty, but the sight of his birth. Captivated by his beauty, worthy tribute. To bring that his fearless love and treat me, crown him now unravel king. Tis the look that melts a tear, tis the face that Stephen saw. Tis the heart that wept with Mary, can alone from my strong, captivated by his beauty, worthy tribute to bring, let his fearless love betray me, crown him now on Captivated by his beauty, worthy tribute is bring. That is still his worth to train me. Crown him now unravel king. That is still his worth to train me. Thanks, Christian. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we get the uh, privilege and joy um, to hear from uh, our friend Joe Longarino. Uh, many of you know Joe, either from um, his uh, service on the steering group or uh, preaching at Oak or um, uh, working in Oak Kids or his life around Durham. Uh, Joe um, left us, speaking of Ascension Sunday and important people leaving, uh, to, to go to Heidelberg, Germany uh, about two years ago on a, dot, on a really prestigious scholarship called the Dodd uh, Fellowship uh, to finish his PhD in New Testament studies, uh, which since he's done that, um, he's also um, uh, found <laughs> uh, an amazing relationship uh, in 
his girlfriend and now fiance, Friedi, uh, who is from Germany, and she's on this call too, um, and uh, still lives in Heidelberg, Germany. So uh, again, all the things that uh, this format doesn't let us do, it lets us uh, connect and hear from our friend live from Heidelberg, where it's about 4 p.m. Um, so uh, I'm going to invite Stephanie to read our passage for today. Um, as we continue in our series on the Apostles' Creed, we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And she's going to read from Mark 8 before Joe takes it from there. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts and be killed. And then after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. The word of the Lord. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Longarino. As Chris mentioned, I was at Oak for a few years before I went to Heidelberg, uh, Germany. And um, uh, Friedi, can you just come here for a minute? If you have to be angry at somebody, be angry at her, not at me. She's the reason I'm here. So thank you. Um, yeah, and we have some of my friends from Germany joining us on this call, and my family is joining this call. It is also my mother's birthday today, so happy birthday, Mom. And um, my sister just sent a private message, I think, but to everybody that says, Go Jojo, which is the name she has called me uh, since she was born. Um, and I would like to ask everybody uh, before I start. If you could just make sure you have a pen or pencil and a piece of paper uh, accessible to you, I won't ask you to use it anytime except at the very end of the sermon. Um, you can also use your phone. That works equally well. But before I start, uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, come and speak to us. Open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. And let us hear your voice. For it's your voice that gives us life. Amen. So I remember that when I was in high school, I was at a friend's house. We were both very ambitious types of students. He wanted to go to Harvard and I wanted to go to Yale. And we were talking about um, just how much we were gonna have to do to get into these schools. But my friend didn't stop there. He kept going. He said, okay, uh, well, we have to do all this stuff in high school to stick out in order to get into these great schools. Uh, but then once we get into these great schools, we have to do all this stuff to stick out in order to get into a high-powered career. And then once we get into a high-powered career, we have to do all this stuff to stick out so people will pay attention to us and remember us when we're gone. And whether my friend knew it or not, 
he was giving voice to a question that has haunted macho culture for a very long time. We can document this question going back at least a few thousand years. Ancient Greek and Roman dudes, they regularly discussed what they'd have to do to get people to remember them once they were gone. Maybe they could write a great literary work so people would read it. Or maybe they would build a huge building that would stand through the centuries. Or perhaps they could accomplish some great deed and they would be memorialized in writing or in a monument. And it was a quest for immortality through their work. It was a quest to keep their memory alive even once they died. And yet this quest always seems sort of strange to me because it doesn't really deal with the reality that death is. It treats death as if it's the equivalent of the question of moving far away. Like, what do I have to do so these people still talk about me when I go someplace else? But this way of thinking is still dealing with death in terms of control. When in fact, death is the reality that reminds us that we're not in control. That no matter what we do, there comes a day when we don't have a say in what happens next. Yet as strange as this ancient macho way of thinking may be, it at least acknowledged the fact that we're gonna die. In our culture today, we often don't even seem to get that far. Just think about the paths that are normally presented to us. When people plan their lives, they typically think about how they're gonna keep making more money. Or they plot how they're gonna keep advancing in their careers. But of course, there comes a day when no matter how much money you made, you can't make any more. And no matter how far you've gone in your career, you can't go any further. Yet we're not really encouraged to think about these facts. We're simply set on a path in continuous motion as if we could do these things forever. The system just doesn't encourage us to face the reality that we will die. And since we don't wanna face that fact, we're more than happy to play along. We throw ourselves into our work without acknowledging the fact that we're human. And yet Jesus comes to us in our frantic activity to challenge that illusion, to break it. In the midst of our frenzied motion, Jesus says, those who seek to save their lives, to preserve their lives, will lose them. It's a fool's errand to think that we can secure a future for ourselves indefinitely. And those who try to do so ultimately come up empty. Now, Jesus' instructions hardly ever make sense in this world. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't be anxious about what you'll eat or wear. Sell your possessions and give everything you have to the poor. Love your enemies, turn the other cheek. Whoever asks you for your shirt, give them also your coat. Whoever asks you to go one mile with them, go two miles with them. When you throw a party, don't invite the rich who can pay you back, but the poor who can't. Spend your time building community with people who won't help you get ahead at all, with prisoners, with the homeless, with the strangers in your country, with those who the powerful ignore, the weak, the despised, the forgotten. All of this seems to add up to a massive waste of time and resources, if that is, your goal is to preserve your life, to advance in this world, and to make sure that your future is secure. But as nonsensical as all those instructions may have sounded, Jesus' words today really take the cake. Come, take up your cross, and follow me. It's as if Jesus is finally confirming what we feared was the case all along. That all those other instructions were really calling us to die to ourselves. 
to tear ourselves away from the security that would seem to provide some sort of assurance in this life, to fall into the hands of God and to yield our control to him. And like Peter, we want to jump in and say, no, Lord, that cannot be the way. Like the disciples, we prefer to ignore the fact that Jesus keeps telling us that if we follow him, we're going to have to face suffering, to deny ourselves, to become servants to everyone, to become like little children, small, ignored, and insignificant in this world. We prefer to keep focused on how to be great, the greatest, to be greater than everybody else. Because even if deep down we know that's pretty stupid, it's at least a lot easier than having to deal with the reality. I mean, to subordinate all my plans to God's plans, to acknowledge that all my ambitions, or at least a lot of my ambitions, may be empty and meaningless, to learn to part with comforts that I can't imagine parting ways with. I mean, does Jesus realize what he's asking us to do? Does he recognize how hard it is? Does he know how scary all this is? And the answer is yes, he does. You see, Jesus isn't just a teacher who tells us what to do. He walks this path before us and with us. The cross we're called to carry is his cross and he knows its weight. Right before he was arrested, he prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He knows what it's like to be in your shoes and in my shoes. He knows what it's like to fear the weight he's calling us to carry. He knows what it's like to prefer to avoid all of this. And yet, unlike most of us, he doesn't run away. Instead, he goes on to pray, not my will, but thy will be done. It's not like he didn't run away because he was less afraid of the pain than you or I would be. Rather, he stayed because he so trusted the one he called Father that he was willing to put himself completely in his hands. And now when Jesus tells us those who lose their lives for my sake will save them, it's as if he's saying, you can trust the Father too. You can walk with me and put yourself in his hands and trust that he will catch you. No wonder Jesus says that we can receive the kingdom of God only if we become like little children. We have to stop trusting in ourselves, in our so-called common sense, in all the patterns of self-preservation we've adopted, and simply put our hands into the hands of our Heavenly Father and trust that even when the way is scary, our Father is good and he's leading us into life a life that's better than any life we could shape for ourselves. A life where we may not have security, but we will have love. Of course, believing and living this is a lot easier said than done. If the disciples teach us anything, it's that we often suppose we have learned a lot more than we really have. After the third time, not the first or the second, but the third time Jesus explains that his path is leading to suffering and death, James and John ask Jesus for the place, places of greatness at his left and right hand. And Jesus tells them, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink? And they confidently answer, we can, only to prove that later they can't. Or at the Last Supper, when Jesus speaks of the suffering he's about to go through, he tells the disciples that they'll all fall away. But when he hears this, Peter says, No, Lord, even if all fall away, that's not going to happen with me. And when Jesus says, 
No, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter responds with twice the confidence. No, even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. And all the other disciples say the same. And of course, we know the story. They all fail. They crack under the pressure. When the rubber hits the road, they can't take up the cross and follow Jesus. Instead, they do the exact opposite. They flee, running as far away from the cross as possible. And yet in the midst of their failure, it's easy to miss a very important part of the story. Jesus predicted their failure. He knew they would fall, but he still promised that after it was all over, he would meet them in Galilee. Despite their failure, he doesn't abandon them. They may have left him, but he doesn't leave them. Even when they gave up hope, Jesus doesn't give up on them. In essence, Jesus is saying to his disciples, Yes, you failed. Yes, you didn't understand. Yes, you didn't have faith. But I'm bigger than your failure. And I'm determined that you'll be my disciple. Yes, when the going got rough, you couldn't take up your cross and follow me. But this is a lesson I'm determined to teach you. There will always be more opportunities to learn to take up your cross and follow me. So don't get hung up on your past failures and don't worry about whether you have the strength because when you're in those situations, it won't be you, but the Holy Spirit working in you to help you learn what it means to follow me. In one way, wouldn't it be easier to be left alone, to let despair have the last word? Because at least in that case, I could just give up trying instead of having to learn to deny myself and be faithful to my Lord. It's almost like having a job where you have an annual review and no matter how badly you performed in the previous year, you just can't get fired. It's like even if you tried to get fired, you couldn't because your boss is so dedicated to your personal development. Because part of what it means to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord, is not only that in the trials and troubles of this life, I have to learn to be faithful to him, but it also means, more importantly, that he is faithful to me, always and no matter what. Despite my sin and failure, he doesn't leave me because he's devoted to me. And so the invitation this week is to open ourselves to Jesus's devotion to us, to let him teach us what it means to take up our cross and follow him. I can't tell you what that will concretely look like for you. Indeed, we can't tell ourselves what that will look like for us because only Jesus knows where he's leading us. Part of what it means to receive the kingdom like a child is not to think we know where we're going, but rather to put our hands in Jesus' hand and to let him guide us on the path. In the Gospels, the disciples are at their worst when they assume they know what it means to follow Jesus. Faith and certainty in this sense don't go together. Faith is rather to recognize that we don't know where we're going or how we're gonna get there, but we trust the one who's leading us. And so like the disciples, when they say, Lord, teach us to pray because we don't even know where to start. I invite us to say, Lord, teach us to follow because we don't know where to start. As a concrete step for this week, I invite you to pick up that pen and paper and write down briefly 
some big things going on in your life right now. Two or three should be enough and you can fill it out more later. There can be concrete tasks, plans, hopes, dreams, or challenges. And then at the top, above them all, write this prayer. Lord, teach us to follow because we don't know where to start. I'll read that again. Lord, teach us to follow because we don't know where to start. You can hang this anywhere in your house and just keep praying this prayer for the next week. So take just a little bit of time to do that. And in a few moments after that, I'll pray. invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, to follow you is life. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to face so many different kinds of death. But we know that in the midst of that, you are with us. You never leave us and you're determined to bring us into life. So we offer our lives to you and say, have your way and lead us. For we trust that you are good. Amen. Amen. We invite Nahood to lead us in our uh, collect and the prayers of the people. Um, I'm going to pray the collect and invite you afterwards to uh, pray as you're led and don't forget to unmute your microphone and uh, after your prayer add Lord in your mercy and we can all pray with you hear our prayer oh God, the oh God the you have exalted your only son Jesus Christ with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where, your, where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God and glory everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have gone before and you are, you know um, what it is to bear a burden um, and to suffer for the kingdom and I'm familiar with what you ask of us. Thank you that you are always faithful and that we can return to you no matter what has come before that returning. Even right now, as we pray, uh, please draw us closer to you and closer to the source of life, Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
Lord, we give you thanks for uh, Katie and Steve and their new little boy. Um, we rejoice uh, with their families and with them. We ask that you um, continue to um, give them uh, healing and rest and uh, the um, expanded capacity to uh, love. Uh, thanks for uh, that gift um, to um, our Oak Church community. Uh, we give you thanks. And um, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, I um, thank you for all of the people of Oak Church. And I just want to um, also lift up Elizabeth and Brian uh, Deva Christensen, God, uh, I just pray for them right now as they prepare to um, move to D.C. Uh, for uh, Elizabeth's work. I thank you um, that that all worked out and that uh, Elizabeth is able to pursue this opportunity. Um, at the same time, it's also really sad to see such awesome members of uh, this community leave, even though they won't be that far away. I just pray for your um, hand in, in guiding them and getting them there safely, especially in this time of great uncertainty and sickness. Um, and again, just thank you for um, their contributions to this community and their friendship. Lord, in your mercy. Your thank you. Friend. God, I ask for prayers for healing in our daughter, Layla. I ask that you would be with her and comfort her and all those who are struggling with illnesses um, and um, sickness. God, please be with those who are hurting and um, struggling right now. Thank you for all that you do. I ask that you would be with those who are in need in that way. Lord, in your mercy. God, I pray for Charles's back. Um, it has been hurting him for months, and some days he is just on the ground because it hurts, and I just feel for him and pray, Lord, that you can just comfort him. Those times are hard physically, but they can be hard emotionally too. Um, just pray for healing and comfort, Lord, in your mercy. You have prayer. Lord, I ask for your guidance and wisdom as um, North Carolina has moved into phase two and Durham prepares to move into phase two. Um, as individuals and as a church and as a community, um, I hope that you'll help us to um, figure out how to live in the gray space of being safer at home and of taking care of our mental health and of being loving towards our family and friends and neighbors um, and how to respond to expectations from family and friends um, while also walking in wisdom and compassion and care for our community and those around us who are more vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy, please hear our prayer. Lord, thank you that we can um, gather in this way to 
sing together and pray together and hear word and even share a little bit of a meal uh, in whatever way we can over the internet. <laughs> um, help us to uh, join you and be near to you as you're near to us. Help us to um, seek you and find you in humble places and we believe in you Jesus and help help our unbelief thank you that you are here and you are with us amen amen you all would join me in our confession together almighty God you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is the head of the church, his body. Amen. You're also invited to share in this Apostles' Creed. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you all to gather elements from your pantries during this time. Maybe you already gathered them, something like bread and juice or wine um, as we share in communion together. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples for a Passover feast. He took bread and it was to signify that bread that the Israelites made preparing to leave in a hurry to, to be saved from um, slavery and death and all of the forces of Pharaoh um, into newness of life. So he took bread, he blessed it giving thanks to God the Father, he broke it and he gave it to, his, to them and said take and eat this is my body given for you. A little while later, he also took the cup and he also blessed it. He um, gave it to them and said, take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of many. As often as you do this, remember me. You pray with me. Lord, we give you thanks for these good gifts, this bread and this cup your body and blood, and we remember you. We remember your love and your life, your service and your sacrifice. We don't remember you like all of those people uh, making much of themselves to be remembered, but we remember you as the servant and Lord of all, calling us to join you and taking up our crosses and losing our lives so that we might gain eternal and everlasting life. Lord, feed us at these tables, these familiar tables that you are making your table, that you are being present to us, that nothing can separate us from your love, not, not isolation, not distance, because you are near to us. Lord, we give you thanks for this feast. Let us rejoice and feast with your church throughout the ages, throughout the world, 
um, we thank you for your body and for getting to be part of it. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's Christ's body and Christ's blood broken and poured out for you. Amen. Um, before I invite Joe to offer a benediction for us, um, I, I just want to uh, reiterate what, what um, a part of Stephanie's prayer that, you know, we will be continuing to um, pray and consider um, uh, about our next steps together um, uh, that, that are continue our abundance of caution, uh, wisdom, um, our desire to continue to gather, uh, which um, we really want to, in our own minds and in, in our words, um, uh, take care with our words that, that we are not reopening the church because we never closed the church. Um, uh, and so um, we want to include you all um, uh, with the steering group uh, in those considerations and the things that we're excited for and um, uh, the things that we're anxious about. Um, uh, and so I uh, look for uh, even this week and, and, and next week uh, communications for ways to be involved in that conversation, both through surveys um, and uh, uh, talk back times and other things. Um, uh, uh, personally, I don't anticipate that um, Zoom Church is going uh, anywhere, anytime, real soon, but there might be some other ways that, that we can be together physically um, in this uh, intermediate time. I shared in the email um, how, um, how fortunate and how honored um, I felt uh, last week with our Zoom difficulties that so many of y'all hung with it. I think that that kind of signals a sort of grace and resilience that we're all going to need in this um, coming uncertain season um, uh, with a lot of things to consider and a lot of things that are unknown and a lot of things that change even on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you for being uh, part of that. Thank you for your, in advance, for your grace uh, and for your ideas and creativity and um, your care uh, for each other and your neighbors. Um, if, if now's a good time to plug the, the uh, email newsletter. If, you, if you're not receiving email, you can drop your email address in the chat and we'll add you to the, the email list because that's your best way to have like up-to-date um, correspondence on things that are like rapidly changing or um, uh, opportunities to contribute. Um, so uh, Joe, um, Will you send us out with a, with a good word of benediction? Mm -hmm. I would just like to thank all of you for letting me have the blessing of be with all of you today. It was wonderful to get to see friends who I had been with for many years, friends who I had only started to get to know, and friends who the rest of you would have become if I had remained there. Um, and I'm sorry who I'm not friends with now. Um, but I pray a blessing upon all of you. And when Stephanie was saying her prayer during the prayers of the people, she talked about North Carolina being in a gray space, but I might've heard first grace space. And I thought that that ambiguity is uh, quite fruitful and very nice to think about discipleship with Christ that it is the gray space that is also the space where we find grace. So it is the gray space that is the grace space. I hope that's not too corny, but I will now give you the blessing. May you go forth this week in faithfulness to Jesus in the midst of the uncertainty and the difficulty. May you find that his grace meets you there, strengthens you, blesses you, and gives you hope. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks so much, Joe.
and uh, if you want to um, talk, 